in terms of the way that the more art we see and the more deep thinking we do about it, very importantly, not just sort of scanning it in a museum for three seconds, but spending time really deeply looking, that as we do more and more of that over time, our thought patterns actually shift and change um, and become more and more complex. Um, so BTS grew out of that work. Their, their goal was to actually help people move through the stages of cognitive development that, that her theory expands, expands. It's currently used in public schools and there's an actual published curriculum for K through eight now, They're working on high school images. It's also used in museums very widely with all ages. Medical schools and hospitals increasingly, and we'll get to a little bit of research about that later. And, and now I'm taking it into the professional world, which is it's a, new, uh, a new journey for me, so I'm happy to answer questions about that at the end if you want. Um, it's also used within higher education, within university settings, and that's what my focus will be on today. So, so you'll know what I've done. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I've been using BTS since 2001. I've spent the vast majority of my career as a curator. Um, at Wellesley College's Art Museum and then Brandeis' Art Museum. I've used it to teach art history and museum studies courses. So within an art history course, I would do BTS at least weekly, including lecturing and other kinds of pedagogical methods. Um, I've integrated BTS discussions into a huge range of classes visiting the Rose Art Museum. And that's where a lot of my interest in the flexibility and applicability of BTS within a range of domains was really tested and where I got to experiment a lot. So during my time as the Director of Academic Programs at the Rose, I probably taught, I think, about 100 classes over three years from 15 or 16 different disciplines across the university. With the vast majority, I used this methodology um, and spoke with professors about it a lot and thought very hard about how it was operating within our classes and what kinds of goals we could meet by using it. I've also done workshops within higher education. A colleague of mine, Alexa Miller, has a consultancy within the healthcare world. She works with a lot of medical schools. She's been teaching at Harvard Medical School for over a decade using BTS and done research on that class and its impact. So I've worked with her a bit, and we put together a workshop together called Seeing and Uncertainty at Brandeis, and we brought together practicing physicians and nurses and healthcare workers with the um, with about 10 or so scientists from Brandeis and talked a lot about um, ambiguity and the process of inquiry within science and the way that images are used within science and why we so desperately need visually literate students. Um, other things I've done with BTS, I've worked with BU Medical School training with Alexa. I've taught the Brandeis Davis Teaching and Learning Fellows, which is a group of faculty from all levels, from brand new faculty to senior people who care a lot about teaching and practice different pedagogical methods together. So I work with them. And then next summer, I just found out that I'll be helping out with um, Philip Yandelwein and I. We'll be teaching a week-long course in BTS for a group of faculty at Lesley University across disciplines. And I'm excited about that because that'll be a space to really interrogate the method at length, instead of doing a little two or three hour workshop with faculty. So there's some things coming up. It's sort of taking root in different places now. Okay, so enough about all of that. Let's see what it is. I know many of you have done BTS, but some of you haven't. Now, it's designed for smaller groups than we have here, just so you know, a little caveat. The perfect size is anywhere from the perfect size is 12 to 15 people, but you can do BTS with 8 to 25 people very effectively. I've facilitated conversations <coughs> with 100 people, so I'm very comfortable with the size of our group, but just keep in mind that it won't operate quite the same way as it would in a classroom, because not every single one of you is going to speak, first of all. I don't think we have time. You might all have something to say. So the way that we begin BTS is by looking. So if you'll please look at this work of art with me. on in the 
this work of art. Um, someone's dead in the middle of a lady would be dead in the middle of a room. Seems like um, it'd be a murder that happened overnight and she's been laying in the room throughout the night as the sun is rising. Uh, if you look through the windows, it seems as though it's early morning and the sun's about to rise, so yeah. Okay, so you're immediately causing a, narr a narrative about the image. Um, so you think this figure is dead? and ha has died, he's been murdered, he's died violently. You, because of the light coming through the windows, you think it might be morning, and that she may have lay there dead for quite a while. What do you see that makes you say she's deceased? Just kind of a look on her face. I don't know, it seems, it'd be an awkward place for her to be lying down, considering there's a couch right there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so partly the, the expression on her face for you, she doesn't seem to be alive looking at her yeah. face. And then you also noted that, that her awkward placement within the room, that there's a couch right here, but she's lying down in this lower part of the image. So you're curious about that. Um, and what do you see that she thinks she was murdered? Um, I don't know. Uh, okay, not sure. So that's spec you're speculating. Maybe, yeah. she, maybe she was killed by someone else, but you're the not way sure. she's laying there, I guess. Well, which, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. What mark was that? Um, it looks like she's in a chair and a lot of work there. Um, which ends up going to go with the cheese and the white jack, because they're laying there in line with a lot of work. That would be a um, sort of uh, Okay, so you're thinking about, um, you, first of all, what do you see that makes you think um, she might be floating like in water? The floor seems too high compared to the couch and the chair, and also on the chair, it looks like there are some water sitting. Okay, so you're, you're, the, the surface she's lying on, you think is water, um, because of the, the, the level in relationship to everything else in the room. And also you see this, this differentiation in the, the chair here, and you think that might be a water stain. Um, so it's soaked up water. You're also reminded of um, a character from literature, Ophelia. And what do you see about her that makes you say that? Um, well, in the Shakespeare, um, she drowns herself in the middle of herself, and she's often submerged like that in water, and she's always wearing a shirt. Okay, so it's, yeah, and you pointed out she was wearing white garments. So, so for you're reminded of other images that you've seen in the in the play, and thinking about the way that Ophelia is often depicted as lying in a pool of water. But what can we do? Yes. So um, I'm not sure about perspective here. It doesn't seem like the walls are square, like it's opened up. But I, what shows me about perspective that I question or I wonder about is physically, or the structure of the body on the floor seems larger than would be appropriate for the room. So the scale of the body is not so appropriate to scale the floor. Okay, so you're looking at a couple of things. One has to do with the, the way the angles of the, the walls meet, and you're a little, you're wondering about the perspective. Is it on or is it a little off? That's your question. Okay, what do you see about those ones that makes you say that? It doesn't look square between the door wall Okay, right here. So this doesn't feel like a okay. So wider angle than a square angle. Okay, great. And um, and then you mentioned. I'm gonna to tell me again. I'm sorry. Uh, the scale of the body oh, yes, to okay. the actual backdrop there seems disproportionate. So she seems a little bit bigger in terms of scale in proportion to the to the other objects in the room. What more can we talk about? I think the staircase is also. Okay. 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 So you're
you're agreeing that the, the, the angles and the space of the roof feels a little off. Um, and, and evidence for that can be used in the staircase. And what about the staircase material? Just the way. Yeah, the way Something about the way that they so this oh, oh this yeah. one okay so something about the, the upper stairs and the way they're that they're angled within the, the field of the picture makes you frustrated that it doesn't quite fit perspectively for you um, and also you brought us back to the idea of a narrative and you're disagreeing that this isn't some a, a, a kind of complete narrative or that it's fragmented you disagree that it's possibly a murder um, and you're also questioning whether this is in fact water. Um, because of its static quality and the fact that it has no surface ripples or movement. So you're wondering, is that really water? Yes, what more can we find? Yeah. Uh, it looks like the main floor of the house has slipped into the basement. Um, I'm interested in the fact that there it looks like there are concrete walls above the wallpaper. Okay. Look up there. Mm -hmm. And then the side of the staircase, mm -hmm. also again, you see raw cement on the side of the stairs. Uh, okay. Closest to us, right, where you wouldn't normally expect that in a living, or it's not, it doesn't necessarily align with the green shag carpeting. So it's just interesting that there's this sinking feeling, and if you look at the front door, it's below the, oh, the wooden, I'm sorry, the side door then, the wooden door right down. Where if you go up the first three steps, it looks like there's a wooden door oh, here. that's uh, too low to go out. It just looks like the whole upper story has gone down a chimney <laughs> or down <laughs> through the basement so that you're seeing the cement that you would normally see of a basement above the level of the wallpaper. Okay, so you're you're finding a quality of sinking throughout the whole setting and, and, and thinking about water and sinking into water and, and connecting that. And for you, the materials in the mm -hmm. room, specifically the cement versus the wallpaper and then what seems to be more cement and walls going on up here that you feel like the whole space, this living room space, has actually slid down and become part of the lower floor. Um, and that's why the, the level is so strange here and, and, and the, in particular this, what do you see that makes you say that's a doorway? Uh, or maybe just where I'm, where I'm sitting, maybe it doesn't look that close up. It's wooden, I feel like I'm looking, maybe I'm looking at like an exterior door. It looks like a door knocker on the front of it. And then I can't see from here what's on laying on top of it, like a little red object, but as though you would have a door jam that you could set something on top of. Okay, so for you this feels like a, a door jam and a, and a little knocker, and it's yeah. confusing because it, it should go lower and it doesn't make sense. Right. right. Great. What more? Yes. Um, I agree that it doesn't seem like there's a uh, coherent narrative here, but um, looking at what other people have said, might be a door. It seemed to me that it was a cabinet with a flashlight on the top. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like she had come down the stairs and cast off of some pink coat and oh, left sure. her flashlight there and uh, taken her shoes off. And that's a very disjointed part of a narrative, but I think it might have some sort of uh, meaning. Okay, so looking more for a story, and um, and and, th and you, for you, this is a piece of furniture with a flashlight on top of it. You're not seeing the door, and then you noticed a couple more details we haven't talked about, which is this pink garment here and these slippers. And you suddenly thought, oh, she's come down the stairs, taken off her robe, taken off her shoes, and here she is in the front of the picture. So you're building a story about where she's come from and where she's ended up. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. Just, just to sort of put together a couple of things that have been said. So we're being teased into creating a narrative by and while recognizing that there are disjunctions or incongruences that, that obstruct that. So the work of art is both presenting what seem to be coherent narratives and then it's also disrupting right. the co coherent narratives that we've built so far. Okay. Sarah? Um, the, the walls, the wallpaper and maybe concrete or some other material above seem to be as though the entire house was flooded, but it doesn't seem to mesh with the fact that the pillows on the couch and the garments over the stairs uh, don't appear to be water damaged. So it creates something very strange with the timeline. Okay, so you're thinking about the passage of time and when the flood may have started and where it started and how high up it went and speculating that up here because of these stains, this whole area was flooded, but then just 
even disrupting your own idea by noting that the, the, the um, pink garment and then these pillows in particular don't look to have been soaked in water, so there's evidence for both sides within the image. All right, yes. Mm -hmm. um, this image reminds me a lot of a like, film still or a film set um, because um, there's not, as others have noted, there's not really a ceiling like where there would be, where the wallpaper ends. Um, and the main figure is, lit, she seems to be like sort of lit very directly from above. Um, and based on the other lamps that are moving and the windows, um, I don't think that like that lighting on her is not mm -hmm. sort of natural. It's not coming from like the ambient lighting around the room. So it looks to me very much like a constructed set um, that has been set up. Um, and like she's, I don't know if she's been placed there or has stumbled <laughs> upon this set, um, but it feels like she's in this uh, sort of created artificial space. Okay, so pointing out some incongruities in terms of light, if this is a, a sort of whole scene, and noting that it looks staged to you. Yeah. It looks constructed and created because of the various light sources. So there's light coming in through the windows that we talked about earlier as being possibly morning. Um, and you're pointing out that because this line here goes up, the, the walls seem to go up in a, in a set-like way. So normally in a, in, a, in a film, you wouldn't even see that, right? Um, it just continues. And then there's this, this light on her that you can't source from anywhere but directly above. So it doesn't seem to be coming from any of the sources that we've got um, within the picture. Uh, so for you, this is, this is a kind of evidence of that staging, that this feels cinematic. It feels like the whole thing was put together. But you're not sure if she was an intentional part of that or if she just wandered into it and put herself there. Right. So what we're yep. Um, to go off Lucy's comment of the artificial nature of the image, uh, the placement of the object seems too perfect. Uh, the pink garment that's hanging over the staircase looks perfectly folded over. The slippers on the stairs are placed in a particular way that's uh, too perfect to me to be natural of a lived-in space. I mean, it looks like a living room and a home, and there's something about it that is just too perfect in its placement of the objects that are there. Okay, so you're noting a few things that we talked about the books here, um, again the slippers, and thinking about how, uh, agreeing with Lucy that this feels very staged, that everything is in its place, that someone put it there intentionally. Um, you also noted that this is a domestic space um, that, that we're set in. We've talked about the couch and the chairs and, and other items, but we haven't particularly pointed that out. Uh, so, so you're you're thinking, hmm, in a real lived-in house, things wouldn't be these slippers wouldn't be exactly particularly placed that way. Okay, so more evidence for you for stage. Yes, yeah, so I'm more for you. Um, I'm noticing an interesting combination and coordination of reflection and repetition in the image. So the surface of whatever liquid this is, I'm going. I think it's water. Um, we see parts of the room reflected in the surface of the, of the liquid. Oh, and also what I'm noticing is that if you look at the, the what, we're, what we can call perhaps the front door, there are rectangular windows that are stepped in a very particular way. And that's echoed in the photographs that are on the wall, on the back wall, which is again echoed in the zigzag of the, of the stairs, and then it's further echoed one could say in the in the larger windows that are on uh, the back wall, and the step reflection underneath oh, the here. stairs, right here. and the window, window the reflection, and then back <laughs> down. Right? Okay, so thinking about compositional dynamics in the piece, and a couple of sort of pictorial themes you're bringing up. One is about reflection, and that you believe this is water because you think it's reflective and it feels like water to you. So we're seeing parts of the room reflected in the water. But, but um, also the idea of repetition or, or pattern or the certain patterns getting repeated, various shapes getting repeated in different parts of the image. So the, the uh, steps of rectangles here are made out of windows and then repeated over here. Um, the, the steps in the stairs going up and down. You have one window here and one window here stepping down again. And then, of course, in the reflections, we have the same. So a very dynamic composition, but with elements, pictorial elements repeated to give it a kind of rhythm. <coughs> so what more can we find? Um, just getting back to the narrative, there's 
a glass of water and put a bottle of water on the table. Okay, okay. So, two details we haven't talked about yet, <laughs> right here <laughs> on the table. Um, pills and water, thinking again about the story, the little cues that help us build a narrative, adding those in. What more can we have? Maybe one more comment. Yeah. Um, the living space itself is very lively and full of color and there's lots of interesting textures and shapes and patterns and then the body itself is completely drained of blood. It looks like she's almost white and her shift is also pretty white and she has this um, opaqueness. It's all, she's almost translucent. I mean, she's um, she looks lifeless, I guess, compared to the actual living space itself, which seems very lived in and warm and friendly with... Um, all the different furnitures and colors. Okay, so thinking about palette, different parts of the, <coughs> of the image, and also returning to, we've talked about her garment being white, or thinking about Ophelia earlier, and you're noting that, that for you, she's she's sort of opaque and white throughout. She has a very different uh, surface color and presence than the rest of the space, which is much, it's filled with warmer colors and feels lived in, whereas she feels kind of a translucent, white, very different. There's a starkness between the surrounding and the figure in the front. I'm going to stop us because we need to start. But thank you so much. I think we could have gone for a lot longer with this image. And um, in a typical, just, you know, in a typical BTS session with students, I would keep going. But um, I want to talk about what we just did. Continuing the image discussion. So, we can all see each other. Can you see it well enough now? Yeah. Sort of. Sort of. Um, well, what was that like? What was that experience that happened during that discussion? what everybody else was thinking about and also noting the range of angles or ways of entering the picture um, helped you see more and you noticed your own thinking shifting. Did that happen to anyone else? Did you notice things that you may not have noticed because somebody else pointed them out or the, the discussion brought them up? That right, so multiple perspectives. What else happened? I think there was a process of being pulled into the picture and then being pushed out as the discussion went along. So kind of, you know, a, a sort of a movement, a subjective movement where you enter and you try to create perhaps a narrative, mm -hmm. try to really have perhaps even an emotional response to mm -hmm. it, and then being sort of distancing yourself and being more objective about it. So it's in and out in, and out. in you know, the that process. So that's, that's sometimes called um, divergent and convergent thinking, and BTS offers both. It, it often does that. Um, often what you'll hear is a kind of gestalt at the beginning. A lot of people are pretty sure about what they see, and then it breaks apart through the discussion, and strands of it start to build up again. So interesting that you're glad you experienced that, because <laughs> that's one of the intentions behind the methodology, to allow that kind of time and space for one image. What else did we do? Yeah. It's interesting just to kind of sort of feel people's um, focus. I don't know how to say that, but it, it wasn't exactly, it was quiet and you sort of could feel people being pulled in, like Claudia was saying. Um, and even hearing little, you know, people in various parts of the room discovering something when someone mentioned it, sort of this idea that things, you, you had that real time experience of, of discovery. Um, amongst people in the room as people saw one thing that they hadn't noticed before and then someone else took us in further to see something else we hadn't seen before, which is a nice feeling. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, there was a lot of this is great. This is great. Um, which BTS is also very active at facilitating. Um, I think it's because the, the, the object of our attention is a very rich and diverse complex thing and we're finally getting some time with it. Um, so great. What, any other responses? 
there's no answers or you know major conclusions or <laughs> <laughs> don't conclude it. Yeah. 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 No, we don't. And and um, it's very important. Why do you think we don't? Sense of maybe why? Well, you want. I mean, for art, it makes sense because you kind of want everybody to come up with their own um, feeling or their, their own conclusions about what mm -hmm. about what the, the artist is saying. Um. So our, a lot of art is ambiguous. The way I like to put it is it has multiple potential right answers. Okay. Um, but it's not, the VTS discussion isn't a kind of free-for-all. Okay. So what checked that sort of, oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. What, is there something I did, but yes. Well, when somebody said something, then you would ask them what they saw to make you think that. So they have to not just like have ideas, but also be able to justify them with what we have in front of us. Okay, so it's, a, it's an evidence-seeking question. What do you see that makes you say that? And this is really critical. And, and for me, this is the, a fundamental element of the rigor of BTS. It seems very simple, but it's a crucial question. Um, so I'm not going to tell you you're right or wrong. I'm going to ask you to tell me why you're saying what you're saying and to give me evidence back in the object. Take me back here and tell me why you're saying that. And sometimes people change their minds or they don't know. And that just gets facilitated in. Any other quick thoughts? You also do a lot of rephrasing. So paraphrasing is really important to BTS. And uh, it, it's, um, it's a huge opportunity with students to teach vocabulary. So it's, it's not repeating. I hope it didn't feel like repeating. It can be a little weird the first time you do it. But it's a way of taking someone's comment, hopefully putting it into better language, because thoughts are provisional. You're just thinking out loud, right? And you have permission to do that within this methodology. Um, and I give it back to you, hopefully, and I and then, and I say, you know, this is what you said, am I right? What did you see that made you say that? And I paraphrase that. So what's the impact of that? How does that, do you think, make students or anyone feel when they're participating? One of the things that I noticed during when we did that was I stopped seeing that as a person and I started to see it as a movie. Mm -hmm. If I just took it out of the human movement, then I would <coughs> it might not even be a person, it might not even be a movie. So, okay, so I think what you're saying, so, so sometimes when you paraphrase, um, I think I might have said figure instead mm -hmm. of woman or something. <laughs> so you can very subtly very, very subtly direct um, the conversation. You can also use speculative language, speculative language in paraphrasing to very gently emphasize this is something you're seeing or thinking. Um, but I'm not saying it's for sure, right? That's especially useful if somebody's saying something really idiosyncratic. <laughs> well, well, you really do. And you say, what do you see that makes you say that? So, okay, for you, this is what that is. And then I kind of dissipates and somebody else says what it is. <laughs> but it, it, it happens in the course of the conversation. So the paraphrasing is a, is a way of steering the conversation, but within paraphrasing, we never add information or ideas that haven't come up. So it's a very subtle kind of tweaking of the comment. The, another very important thing about paraphrasing is it, everybody feels heard and is heard. Okay. Everybody twice. Everybody's heard twice. Now, and it, this is a big group, so some of you in the back may not have heard what the people in the front say. <laughs> but in a classroom, we hear each other, and then it's paraphrased, so everything is said twice. It's very powerful in terms of people's empowerment to speak and their um, belief that they can make meaning. And there's a lot of studies on this in organizational behavior, actually, about psychological safety and feeling heard. It's a huge difference in people's learning. And it doesn't mean that you're telling them that they're completely right or they're great. Because I didn't do that, did I? Right. I also didn't tell people they were wrong. Any other quick thoughts? I'm going to get, go through the methodology here. And stop, but. All right, so these are the basic elements of BTS facilitation. I'm just going to go through them quickly. And if you have questions, let me know. So image selection is actually really important. Um, I, in many, many ways, I think it's the most important part of BTS, probably because I'm an art historian. 
But picking the right image for your discussion, or if you're from a different field, picking the right text, very important. Because you need to find something that is ambiguous. You need to pro find a problem that is a little difficult to sort through. If you know exactly what you want your students to get out of something, don't be too messy. <laughs> Just tell them. <laughs> if you want them to find their way through and realize how complicated our work of art is, which most of us do, that's why we, we are careful. Um, and there's a whole guide to image selection. We could get into Sandy knows a lot about it. Um, that has to do with that theory of cognitive development and the patterns of thinking that people are doing at different stages in their development as they look at more and more art, and all very helpful. One thing, for example, you wouldn't start with would be, say, rock. <laughs> but there are many things in your book, I can test So you could do that later. But you would want to start with, especially with students who haven't spent a ton of time looking at art, with, with images that have some kind of narrative influence. I've actually done a lot of decoding, which is great. So you know, it doesn't mean that it has to be um, illusionistic. Or, but, but it needs to have narrative content, something that, that students can grasp onto in a, in a legitimate way. Because the last thing we want is a bunch of crazy idiosyncratic readings that end up nowhere. If you choose the right image, people capture most of the meaning in their own language and on their own terms, through their own experiences, but they won't end up in the wrong place. If you pick the wrong image, they end up in the wrong place. It's not true to them. It's important. Uh, so, I started with silence. So what does silence do? What happened during that moment of silence? What did you do? You look. Yeah. Yeah. You you engage, right? Right? Well, and you came up with something. So you each independently were thinking and noticing and trying to sort through it. So in other words, I didn't make somebody speak before anybody had a chance to get a hold of <coughs> their foothold in the image. This is why, one reason why BTS was such a paradigm shift in the museum world, because people had never been asked to look before. <laughs> they were always just told what was going on. They were in, in, immediately right in front of the work of art saying, okay, so this is a photograph. But before they could even get a chance to, to dive in to the, to the image as a, as a visual manifestation of ideas before all the others. I also like that silent moment and that moment to get a foothold and to be an independent thinker because one dynamic that I really like about BTS that somebody mentioned or referred to a little bit is that it's not groupthink. People still disagree and have their own thought process going, yet it's a collective problem solving process. So it's a really nice balance between the group and having your own independent thinking. Um, so it's not expected that everybody's going to end up in exactly the same place. So I only asked three questions. We've already talked about one of them. What do you see that makes you say that? I opened with what's going on. You can also see what's happening in this picture. Now, why do you think that's worded the way that it is, given our conversation? Anybody have a sense of that? Yeah. It's open-ended. Right. Open so the person brings whatever they see, and there's no right and wrong to begin with. It's also, it also instigates narrative. Yeah. So a fascinating, as they were coming up with these questions, at first they would say, what do you see? It turns out when you <coughs> ask people, what do you see, they list. Mm -hmm. They just start listing things, and they don't start building ideas and concepts and bridging together parts. This kind of question instigates nouns and verbs. <laughs> so I like to think of it, more active language. So what do you see that makes you say that? We've already gone over that. It's the evidence-seeking question, the kind of rigor question. And the third, what more can we find? So that question lets you know that I don't think you're done, and that you're not done, <laughs> and you should keep going, while validating everything that's happened to that point. Very simple. All three of these questions were researched mostly for years, in the late 80s and early 90s, to get the wording just right. For example, what do you see that makes you say that is much more gentle and generous and rigorous, then why do you think that? Those, those two questions is to get a completely different kind of emotional response in a viewer or a student. And 
as an aside, part of the goal of BTS was also to help people feel comfortable in front of art and to feel able to find meaning in art. And so that sort of psychological safety that's set up through the methodology is really important. If you know what I mean, if, that people do speak, that they're not afraid that they don't know. And as a curator for a really long time, I know a lot of people are so afraid in front of art. They have a lot of fear about not knowing the right thing or not saying the right thing. And they, they want me to tell them. This is a gentle way to say it. <laughs> so this is what I did as a facilitator. I pointed a lot in the middle laser. It's called visual paraphrasing. That's a way for me to make sure I know exactly which part of the picture you're talking about, and you can tell me now. It also does a huge amount for that focus that we all felt. Everybody's eyes are in the same place, and everybody knows what, exactly what the person is, is addressing. And then the rephrasing or paraphrasing we've discussed. I also did something called framing a little bit in this conversation, where I would, when I began the paraphrase, I would say, oh, you're, so you're, you're bringing up narrative again. You're thinking about palette. You're bringing our attention to composition. This is a subtle way of um, letting people know that there are a lot of different angles we can take as we look at a work of art. They can definitely all work together, but they are different. And this is a fascinating um, part of VTS that I'm really interested in because over time it helps people realize their own biases. Kind of leads them into considering their own thought processes and the sorts of things that they latch on to most. And, and that can be really important in terms of um, creating a richer argument around a work of art or um, sort of checking one's own impulses in viewing. So it, it creates a richer sense of our own thinking. So, and then I also link. So linking is when you draw together earlier ideas. Instead of summarizing, as BTS facilitators or teachers, we link. So we, we point out when ideas are building. We point out if there are different ideas. But we never summarize everything. So why don't you think we summarize? What would that? First of all, OK, I'll just tell you. Because I can never summarize that entire 35 minute conversation. It would be boring. And it would be repetitive. And it would also privilege one part of the conversation over another. And it wouldn't make much of a difference. So if at the end I did say, OK, oh my gosh, Eliza, you finally got it. That was so great. <laughs> We're done now. How would that make everybody else feel, right? I feel great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, you would feel better than everybody else. Yeah. So that's also why we stick neutral as teachers. And I this might feel like a very tight kind of, wow, I can't do this, I can't do that sort of methodology. But in fact, by following these fairly simple and to me very elegant rules or this structure, it opens up the most amazing opportunity to listen, first of all, to students, to paraphrase hopefully in ways that urge them on in their learning, to seek evidence, to push them in just the right ways, um, and to give them time to just dwell in the image together. I mean, I know that those of us who are art historians or students who really care, you, you can't stop looking at some art. And I was telling Eliza an old friend that I finally got to see, um, and I finally went to the Prado. And hours with certain paintings, it wasn't enough for me. I couldn't handle it, that I had to walk away. So if we want people to develop in their thinking and gain experience, they need a lot of time. And this is a structured way to give them that time and really support them when they're looking, but let them find their own way. That's why we stay neutral and we don't summarize. All right, so there have been, I have a couple of additional questions that I sometimes use with BTS within undergraduate courses. And I only do this if the students, and it's usually, honestly, with younger students, um, if they aren't bringing up ideas related to their course through the BTS discussion. Most of the time, if I pick the right image, the, the, the issues or thoughts that they're concerned with in their course naturally start to arise. They start talking about what they've been learning, if I picked the right image. 
So if you're not doing that yet, after 15 minutes or so, I'll ask them, how does this discussion about this work of art or text, this text image data set, relate to your readings or our you know, your prior class discussions to the major questions of this course, which just prompt them a little bit. And usually somebody adds something, then we go from there. Another really useful way to think about VTFs within undergraduate education in particular is that reflecting on what you just did can be really, really important for them to understand their own thinking and their own position as learners. As, I, as time went on at Brandeis, and I taught these hundred classes <laughs> visiting, professors loved it when I would take 10 minutes and reflect on what we had just done. And the students would begin to understand why they were looking that way and what being in a learning space while looking, a visual um, experience of learning, what matters about that and what happens, and how much longer they need to spend with the edges and how and why this neutrality and this strange way initially that I seem to be guiding them actually is, is really, really invigorating for them. So we reflect a little bit on the method. And, and in doing that, they sort of metacognate about their own learning process. And I know I had some great uh, fans of this method at Brandeis, particularly the folks from that um, team of fellows who were studying pedagogy because they really want students to be more adamant about their own learning processes and more aware of why they're doing what they're doing. Um, you should always think about how you're being taught and how you would like to teach. Those are good things to dip into. Another question that you can ask, so this came up yesterday with MAP. So sometimes, say you want to, I don't know, you're teaching a, a course on um, Baroque art or ancient Roman art, you can look at three iconic works of art, two or three, and say, okay, if this is all we know about ancient Roman art, what do we know? What have we built up? What kind of um, visual vocabulary do we have for this? You can do this occasionally in your process. Just sort of stop, DTS some images, check in where you are. What is Baroque? based on this. What is Romanesque? Or what is a um, what is a pictorialist photograph, for example, if we look <coughs> deeper at these things? And they'll have amazing visual evidence for understanding what that style is about. It doesn't mean that you're not going to go read and add all kinds of other um, meaning making to it, but this helps them understand it visually. So there's been some research on VTS within uh, the healthcare arena. Like I mentioned, there's a course at Harvard Medical School that was studied over a few years. Um, and within education, because VTS was initially, the curriculum was initially focused on public schools. The methodology was for everybody, but the published curriculum was focused on public schools, K through five initially. And there was, and there were probably four or five now, um, reliable studies, well done studies on its impact. So we know that this process, and this is VTS done over time. So I'm sorry if there's one discussion and you don't get to leave and say that <laughs> or you're finished. You're completely visually literate, although most of you are. Um, it develops aesthetic and critical thinking skills. It does, over time. In um, kindergartners through fifth graders, it takes 10 hours a year for three years for them to move through an entire stage of their development. This is fantastic because there is no visual literacy taught in American public schools. Right? It's hardly, hardly happens. Yet, as we know, it connects up deeply with all kinds of other ways of um, gaining knowledge and meaning making in the world. Observation is key to so many different disciplines. So, for example, what I mean by aesthetic and critical thinking skills, I mean that students learn to separate inference from observation. This is something that science professors care so much about. They go crazy because students are always inferring meaning from a data set or um, something in a field in a biology class that they're looking at. And they, they, have, they spend a lot of time in their students' students. They, they learn to supply visual evidence for interpretation. So Lucy was telling me, Lucy, that she did DTS with some of your peers yeah. over a semester, and that by the end, she hardly ever had to ask, what do you see that makes you say that? 
they started supplying the evidence themselves. Very important. It seems small, but it's big. It also helps people hold multiple perspectives. This is high-level abstract thinking. That you can consider a series of ideas or concepts related to an image simultaneously before you settle on one or more. It helps us develop art-based frameworks for the interpretation of art. So what that means is that for most graduate students, I mean uh, undergraduate students, and for most museum goers, they have yet, not yet had enough experience viewing art in a thoughtful way to develop what we think of as art-based frameworks. So they don't have, they have frameworks from other parts of their lives. They have frameworks from whatever, um, say, English education. They have frameworks from their life experiences, from their religion, their other kinds of belief systems that they're admired in. They're viewing often of photographs in mass media. So that becomes a kind of measure against which they look at almost all art. So it's not realistic, it looks weird. I don't get it when they look at a, at a painting that, that isn't photographic or illusionistic. Um, through doing BTS, we know that they actually start to ask themselves questions that are based in their experience with art. So they're, they're creating a new framework with which to analyze works of art. They're making sense of the work of They also think about their own thinking. So we also know from, especially in medical studies, if, DTS improves observation skills, which include, the, this seems, seems silly, but there's a number of observations made. The precision of language that's used to describe what's seen and the amount of time spent looking. Now this is so important in the medical world because misdiagnosis is primarily human error. And doctors very often stop looking. They don't spend enough time messing around in that ambiguous place of not knowing what's wrong with the patient trying to sort through the data, what they're seeing, what they're hearing, what they're gathering. Their impulse is to diagnose. And when they diagnose too quickly, they're wrong more often. And by practicing BTS on works of art, medical personnel have gained more comfort with that experience of being uncertain. And they understand that they need to wait longer. They need to think more. They need to look harder. They also use better language to describe what's wrong with the patient, which can make a huge difference in terms of diagnosis. Now, all of this, to me, parallels better art history papers, <laughs> um, time spent building a, an argument about a work of art or thinking through what it might mean. So misdiagnosis just means getting it wrong, not being careful enough. BTS also, interestingly, increases communication and collaboration skills and the way that participants value those. This has been studied too. So after um, three months of 10 BTS sessions, doctors and nurses, that's where this, these studies are all from the medical realm, they actually value listening to each other more than they did at the beginning. So this is a huge shift in that arena. And means a lot for um, student work too. And then this idea of comfort with ambiguity, I've already talked about that, but this process of inquiry and, and letting yourself continue to dig and look and not stop, it can be an uncomfortable place, but a very rich one. And BTS must <coughs> um, allows that and prevents premature decisions in the face of complex problems. Mm -hmm. So those are, any questions about any of this? Yes? What kind of objects are the doctors and nurses BTS? Well, in, for the Harvard program, they went to the MSA in Boston, and the BTS teachers chose different images. They were from all periods. Yeah, like oh, yeah. 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 Well, that's a great question, because one reason why works of art are so crucial to developing visual literacy and aesthetic thinking is that they are probably the most complicated <coughs> visual material we have. They're intentionally made. Um, many of them, the great masterpieces in art, have lasted through generations of scholars continuing to grapple with them. So they have a depth of meaning and interest that isn't paralleled in very much other visual material. Um, and it, it, for the medical students, it becomes a kind of corollary for the patient him or herself. A complex human being who's giving you some information but not other information and has different <coughs> kinds of symptoms. Really, um, so that's why they use art. And is it also the case too that doctors, when you go to, when you go to a doctor, 
um, I've been in a situation where a doctor has had an entire scan of my body to see what's wrong with it. And in fact, they need to look really closely at digital imagery, often on a screen tip, in order to analyze and figure out what's going on. Are you healing properly? Is something not healing right? So I would say that that, that is where that yeah, there's a direct bullet, yeah. That imagery within the medical world and most scientific fields is right. Mm -hmm. There's a, a chemistry professor at Brandeis who loves the BTS, and he brought his whole lab team, the graduate students and faculty. And um, we did BTS for an hour, and he started doing it with him on art because he felt that it reset his team, that they often, you know, they'll get a bunch of data, and they all start leaping to conclusions about it, and they needed a methodology that could let them sit with it for a while in an even-handed way. So he's really interested in, in that idea. And th there's a, a doctor in Boston who I know runs a team of residents. He starts every residency meeting with BTS. Now, you know how little time doctors have, <laughs> right? Seriously. But for him, it's such a valuable intervention because it, it everybody feels equal by the end of that conversation. And they can talk about whatever case they have at hand, it shifts the way they deal with each other. And it saves time for him, time arguing or disagreeing or feeling stuck. Um, sometimes he does it with art and sometimes he does it with x-rays or, or scans, MRIs, whatever. Um, but it, 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 for him, it's been a, a, a huge shift in his practice. Any other? Yeah. Are there certain kinds of art for which uh, this doesn't apply to an Ellsworth Kelly, for instance? I've done Ellsworth Kelly before, but only with um, advanced art history students who've looked at a lot of art and have a context for it. So they have some of those frameworks, and so those things came up in the conversation. But it was also interesting because we talked about, there's a fantastic Kelly in the Rose Collection that I love, early one, from 62. And it's two huge curved blue shapes, and they just touch in the middle, and there's white above and below. And they began seeing like two pregnant bellies touching. Mm -hmm. And they knew that that wasn't what Kelly was talking about. So they were able to discuss that too, but they became interested in when can you really have full abstraction, which is a great question. We're always seeing something in abstract shapes. So it was a great discussion, but I would never start with it. Um, I would start with, right across the way was a Rauschenberg that was fantastic. Um, or I've even done Jasper Johns, which has more accessible material in it. We had a drawer painting, it was amazing. But no, it's not for everything. And I also, I want to emphasize something that I don't think that BTS is the only way we should teach. But I think that dipping into it occasionally can really shift the learning that's going on, the appreciation of visual images as manifestations of concepts in and of themselves. That, that there's a way of conveying ideas that is visual, right? That that's what they do. <laughs> that's why artists made and didn't write about their ideas. And I don't think that we spend enough time in that space digging through them. There's a professor at Harvard who wrote a great little piece in the Harvard Magazine about how she looked at um, a painting at the MFA and it took her 45 minutes to notice a really key detail because it's a really complicated painting. And that's for, I, I, BTS can help people get there, where they can actually spend 45 minutes looking at something. But to ask a student to do that without much experience, it's really hard. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, you can do it. I, but the, the interaction of ideas is so rich in BTS that you get further. Um, so, so when I've used it, for example, I've done BTS and then just launched into a lecture. I'm just going to worry about it. Here's, a, you know, we're going to do a looking session. We're going to think through looking for a while. Now I'm going to give you some art historical context and information and tell you what all these amazing scholars who've spent decades studying what you just spent 20 minutes looking at, what they think. They've gone on with the process that you just started really well. I say to my students, you just, that was an incredible conversation, you really dug into this, let's think about what people who have spent their careers thinking about this have come up with. So you can still validate what the students have found, and if you've picked the right image, you can refer back to their conversation through the lecture. So you guys know this 
this, this, and, and this about this work of art, and here's the kind of art historical context for the things they do. Okay, so I have a few examples of the works of art that, this was a, a, a Richard Prince photograph that I used with a sociology course called Masculinity. This is a just, uh, you can't really see it, this is a cowboy. This is from his Marvel Romance series. You want me to turn down the lights now? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Sam. Um, this was one of the, this is one of the most amazing conversations I've ever had. Most of the students, there were probably 20 of them, they had never been to the rows, most of them. Very little experience. They spent 50 minutes solid looking at this. They figured out, well, they figured out that someone had taken a photograph of a photograph. They figured out it was the Marlboro Man. They, they connected it to their course on masculinities. This was late in the semester, so they had a lot of ideas about masculinity to bring to bear, so I wouldn't do it the first day of the semester. Um, the professor, Gordy Feldman, who's been at Brandeis for 50 years and is one of my favorite people to work with there, <laughs> he, he and I were astounded. We just sat back and enjoyed, well, I, I didn't because I was facilitating, but we just enjoyed this immensely interesting conversation that they had. So it was the right image for the right group of people. They talked about mass media images, they talked about narrative, it was disjointed, right? But by the end, all the ideas that had come up had scaffolded a couple of different interpretive strands of this. It had really um, grappled with it on its own terms. I would never do this, for example, in reproduction because you don't get the pixelation. So I'm very particular. If you're gonna do a prince, one of these, you have to have the real thing. Because they get closer and they start to realize, it's pink, this isn't. A photo. This is a picture of a picture. I can, I can see the magazine, the, um, the dots. So I wouldn't do it because if you don't know this image, then it wouldn't, it wouldn't fly. It would be a western landscape of a cowboy. Um, here's a riche. We had a great riche show at the Rose, and I brought a linguistics class in. The teacher was, the professor was really skeptical, but luckily. <laughs> Everybody at Brandeis felt so bad about almost losing their collection <laughs> <laughs> that when I called them, they were like, okay, okay, I'll come, I'll come. I'll come. <laughs> um, so she told me later, she said, I put this on the last day of the semester because I was sure it would never work. And I was nervous, but I wanted to support the rose and I wanted to try it out. So I came. It was so much fun. The students looked at this image and another one for about 20, 25 minutes each. And they brought up all kinds of ideas about um, semantics. They had been learning during the semester. And then she gave a, a little summary lecture at the end to help them get ready for their final. And we ended up looking at all these other paintings in the room while she was doing it. And it, it, was, just, it was a really wonderful experience. And one of the students decided she wanted to write a thesis on Boucher. And that, that was what she was going to pursue. This is a, a war hall at the rows, and I'm not gonna go through all these classes, but I used this over and over and over and over and over. It's one of our great paintings. Um, I used this a lot for doing ETS and then reflecting on the methodology, um, which is quite a relevant discussion, for example, in influence, power, and identity, or in the sociology of empowerment, both classes that are about, in their ways, facilitation and teaching and leading. So we had great discussions. But what I wanted to point out about this, so there's this strip of white here. Very important part of this painting. I've probably facilitated discussions about this 20 times, maybe more. I've never, ever facilitated one where anybody found this before 15 minutes in. They're too, this is too disturbing. It's too rich, it's too complicated. But this white strip, that's when they start talking about this. That's when they start talking about film. They always find it. So VTS has taught me to, to trust my students. That if I give them the right image and I really steward their conversation, they will get there. I used to be so afraid they wouldn't get there. No. Just keep it going, it's great. It always happens. Every time they eventually found it. And then we use this wonderful fundamentals like quite a bit. I was skeptical that this could work with BTS. It was amazing. Every conversation 
we ended up with a very bifurcated view of the piece, which speaks to the deep ambiguity. What? It speaks to the piece, right? Yeah. The bifurcated. Yeah. yeah. Well, this idea of reaching up or sinking down, death, life, hope, loss of hope, despair, all of those things came up. And then uh, one last example. So I curated this exhibition by Dor Gaz, who's a contemporary artist from Israel. And this was a, a show that was mostly video. It's a little bit tough to BTS video. So um, instead of using BTS exclusively for this show, because I taught about 20 classes in the show, it was exhausting. <laughs> but um, I would BTS this first room, the entire installation for 15 or 20 minutes. Because the video here is very short. It only lasts about two minutes, so you can get a sense of it over time. And we would kind of get settled into the visual language of Gez. Some of the ideas of, of the show would emerge. And then we would go into these other rooms back here and watch longer videos and have more slightly more directed conversations about them. Because when you can't paraphrase and point everything, it, it doesn't work as well. But it definitely sets up a tone for a conversation about longer form art that is, is richer for the initial experience of this open-ended discussion. And this was a very um, useful methodology because this show was deeply disturbing to many students at Brandeis um, because it was about uh, racism against Christian Arabs in Israel. So it was a, a somewhat controversial subject for a lot of people. So I found that by opening the conversations with BTS, everybody felt more comfortable and they can express their um, responses a little more freely. And we had very rich conversations that covered some pretty difficult topics out of that base. So I think I've covered all this. <laughs> uh, one thing I love to say about BTS, and I, I'd love to hear if you agree, but it, it, it covers, it is scholarship. And a little time, yeah, one conversation. Right, you, have, you look, you hypothesize, you debate, you have dialogue, you look again, you find evidence, you look again. So by doing it, you can set students up to then go out and do their research. They have better research questions that emerge out of an age discussion. I think we're over time there, so I'm not going to, um, oh, I, let, I call it the continuous switch. You're never really done, so I think it's wonderful to initiate that. And with that, I will end this. If anyone has any questions, I'd love to. about your transition and where you're going. You're, you're talking about reaching out to professionals. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about sure. some of the ideas you have there? Yeah, so what I've been doing, I, I've done a BTS workshop, for example, at Harvard Business School, um, because they have a methodology called the case study methodology, where they take a, a, a study of a particular business event or decision, and they analyze it quickly, and it's all open-ended. And so, BTS discussions really do um, parallel that quite well. And I'm finding that in certain sectors of business, they're very interested in visual literacy. It actually matters to them. They're working with um, visually based materials, or they, they recognize that their employees are kind of missing a cognitive strand that could be really innovative and creative. They have somewhat limited notions that <laughs> stuff is. So I'm hoping to educate them. But there's a, for example, there are two strands within the business world I'm particularly interested in. One is called design thinking. Has anybody heard of that? <coughs> um, there's, a, there's a company called IDEO in California that instigated this, where they take the processes of designers and apply them to all kinds of problems, not just business, actually. And there's a school of design thinking at Stanford University within their business school. So I'm going to teach a pop-up class there, and I'm very curious. They, they talk so much about <coughs> visual thinking. And it's mostly there through sketching and drawing. Um, so I've met some design thinking folks in Boston who think that BTS could fill a niche with art. I also have a secret agenda to um, help people more authentically experience art than I think they often do within other arenas. So that's kind of where I'm going. But I'm also working with museums. So next week I'm doing a, a BTS leadership workshop with a bunch of museum directors. 
as a matter of fact, contemporary art museum directors. Um, so it'll be really interesting <laughs> to see how that goes. Um, so I'm kind of in this very exploratory phase and seeing where it sticks and where it works and, and where it's appreciated, what people want to learn. Always with art. Yeah. I'm curious, um, the examples we've seen are mostly modern and contemporary. Mm -hmm. um, are, have you been able to work with ancient material or non-Western material? I did when I taught ancient to medieval. These examples are all from the Bros collection, which is primarily post-war. I actually meant to say that. So. Um, but yeah, I think they do, especially within the context of a class, because the students are gathering other kinds of information about the pieces. So I, I could go back and see, I picked I had about 12 works of art in my ancient medieval class that I really wanted students to know. You know, those iconic pieces that we want people to be able to identify and understand, so I would test all of those. I will say, if you want your students to really remember a work of art, you can talk till you're blue in the face about it, but if you ask them to look together and they have that experience you guys just had with the focus and the listening, they will never forget. They'll be still they'll still be talking about those works about the next day. Yes. When you're using GTS in the classroom, is there a way that you can um, push them to see what gets lost in the So they can start maybe thinking about scale and materiality in a way that's yeah, you know, I have before, I, I remember, it's been a few years since I taught art history, but I remember I would, so I remember we were we were looking at um, some Egyptian uh, statues of pharaohs, a series of them, and I gave them the scale. So I told, and I also showed them three views at once, of one sculpture, and we would ETS all three views. Um, I talked about, so I did some manuscript illuminations and I told them the size. Um, and I would try to find the best possible reproductions so that they could pick up on the materials, but if it was bad, I, I would let them know. Because that's it, within, within that learning context of a class where you're, you're um, <coughs> gathering knowledge week to week, it's fine too. I think that's great. I think it's confusing in a one off. Like you should just pick an image where you don't have to do that. <laughs> but I think, yes, absolutely. And the scale thing was something I struggled with when I first learned BTS. Um, I was like, but you have a curator. But I've come to realize that many people's thought patterns, they're not there yet anyway. So if you can get them to pick a little. But yes, absolutely, you can add. Um, like there's an Audrey Fleck that I love, but it's, it's confusing because it has a painted gold frame within it. So if I use that in reproduction, I tell people, the edge of the work of art is here. This is all an edge. Because I don't want, they, uh, they don't realize. And it's not fair for art. Has there been any research done about modifying BTS to include sketching or? Oh, you know, the Harvard Medical School study um, had a sketching component. Yes. That's the only one that I know of. There have, in, in some of the, if the um, elementary education studies, they did this really cool thing where they they um, they did it, they measured the aesthetic stage of these kids every nine months so they could see the growth. But they also gave them objects unrelated to art, scientific tools, and had them talk about those. And they saw changes in the way that they described those objects and decided what they were. They also, there's a ton of um, writing exercises. BTS is great for improving writing for adding detail. Um, so you'll see children, you know, at the beginning of the year, third grader, there's a chapter that Philip and Alex and I just wrote about visual literacy in BTS that I'll share with you guys in January if you want. It's going to be published then. But we have a couple of very specific examples where a child who hasn't done any BTS is asked to describe an image. He provides no evidence. He has idiosyncratic readings. It's only one sentence. A year and a half later, he's got 10 observations, seven of which are backed up with evidence, he's got a narrative, everything is pretty accurate. Like, you know, he's had enough experience that he's careful, it's amazing. Yeah. And you can do that with college students too, it helps with the visual analysis papers a lot, I think. I used to give the three questions for a visual analysis paper and that was it, that was it. <laughs> I didn't worry about all the other, so I was like, okay, here are your three questions. Go look at this at the MFA. And I would say, make sure you look at it for at least a certain amount of time. And you know, take a break and then go back and look again. Take all your notes. Go home and ask yourself some questions. Form a narrative. 
Any others? Thank you.